Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to settle down, please find a seat if you can. Just a few parish announcements before the talk this evening. Coming up uh, this Sunday, we have the London Hat Walk. On Saturday, the 20th of April, we have the annual Punt Picnic and Plunge at Oxford. Sunday, the 5th of May, it's the Chap Flanner Walk. Celebrate the 25th anniversary of that rag. Uh, and 17th to the 19th of May, we have the Children's Weekend at the Beach. And 1st and 2nd of June, we have the New Sheridan Club Jaunt to Italy. Ooh. Um, details are all on the Inter website. Next talk is on the 1st of May, talk to be confirmed. Please, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got one yet. I'd uh, just like to introduce tonight's speaker, Darcy Sullivan, who will talk on decadence in comics. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you. Now, I have to start by asking how many people here would consider themselves at least a bit au fait with decadence as it applies to literature? Literature? As opposed to a lifestyle. <laughs> I, I was hoping you would all raise your hands because the first thing you would expect to find in any book about decadence as a literary tradition is a definition of it. That's the last thing that you'll find. The first thing you will find is an explanation of how impossibly hard it is to define decadence and what it was. So briefly, and summarizing to a gross degree, it was a literary tradition of the last 20 or 30 years of the 19th century, primarily in France, a little bit in England, a little bit in Italy, as we will see. Um, and there are some, there's even some Americans who supposedly thought of themselves as decadents. Um, but one of the most recent books about decadence, Decadence in Literature, by Jane Desmarais and David Weir, they said decadence has been used to describe racial degeneration, historical decline, philosophical pessimism, personal immorality, physical entropy, artistic imperfection, and more. So I'm, now you all feel at home with that definition. <laughs> It's also very closely tied with ideas of artificiality, art for art's sake, evil, morbidity, and even a touch of Satanism gets it there. So it was, it was basically a, a number of primarily French authors who were very dissatisfied with modernism and life in their part of, of the century in France. And so they wrote things that were pessimistic, morbid, um, distressing, and not classical. And they were, it was a big revolt against the primary uh, literary tradition of the time in France, which was realism or naturalism, which you associate with people like Balzac and Zola and people like that. So it was kind of a reaction against that. And it didn't last very long, as all good things do not. So it didn't go very long. Um, now, Describing decadence in comics might seem like it would be even harder. In fact, it's much easier. There's no such thing. So there's no, that is, there's no decadent movement in comics. And the reason is this because there's no literary movement, as you think of the literary movement of any kind, that transfers over from fiction to comics. It just doesn't work that way. Comics has its own trends and movements, but they're really unrelated to anything that's happening in literature. But there are many signs that we can find of decadence and the decadent tradition in comics. And actually, there's more now than ever, in part because comics continue to grow and become more adult or mature, but also because decadence itself is studied more and more, and there's more people interested in it than ever. But it's also really at odds with the comics medium for various reasons. Uh, the first of these is thematic. So it has, as we've discussed, dark themes, and there are plenty of dark themes in comics, but they tend to either go into the crime genre or the horror genre. That's primarily where you'll find the sort of morbidity that, that you would find in, in decadent literature. And the second of these is structural. So a lot of decadent novels, not very much happens. 
Um, if you think about the classic one, the one that probably most people, or some of you have read, Arbor by J.K. Huismans, also known as Against Nature, it's basically about a guy who never leaves the house. <laughs> so it's not something that you can really put a lot of panels to and have action. Comics depend on action. It's movement from one panel to the next, kind of like film. There's also never been a film version of Arbor <laughs> even though it's quite famous. And the third reason is just pure com commerce. So literary adaptations don't do particularly well in comics. There are many of them, but uh, there's, th it's not a primary genre. So we are going to look at some things. We're going to talk about, first of all, some adaptations of works or works about decadent authors. We're going to talk about Dorian Gray a bit. We're going to talk about a really interesting case of what I would call decadent narrative and linguistic tropes in 1970s horror comics. So man, we'll, we'll wake up at that point and go, all right, because we're going to talk about Skywald. And as a special case, and with, with looking at Ada here, we will talk about the portrayal of Gabriel D'Annunzio in Fumetti, which is Italian comics, for those of you who don't know. So we'll have to go a little bit quickly. So first of all, we'll talk about the decadence in their works. Now, there are quite a few versions of Le Fleur de Mal by Baudelaire that are illustrated. We're not talking about illustrated books here. We're talking about sequential narrative in panels. We're talking about comics. We're also not going to talk about manga because I don't know very much about it. And also, they don't really cover the French um, literature very much, although there is actually a, a series called Le Fleur de Mal in manga. Um, Baudelaire gets a, a good look in. There are a couple of books of Baudelaire's poems in bande dessinée which is the French word for comics. Um, they kind of suck, uh, <laughs> primarily because, you know, poems need comics, need pictures, like paintings need captions. It just doesn't work. A poem should work on its own, and it doesn't need to be illustrated. And in particular, it could be illustrated, but if you try to put it into a narrative story, you're kind of working against the whole poetic structure. So there are some like that. There's many more that portray Baudelaire himself, everything from sort of comical versions of it to quite serious ones. Um, some of them, like the one on the right there, are about his, his uh, Roman Rive de Edgar Allan Poe. So as you may know, the, the decadence, in particular Baudelaire and Stéphane Mallarmé, were hugely influenced by Poe. If Poe had lived in France at that period of time, he would have been called a decadent. He's not now, but he has the same sort of morbidity, the same sort of pessimism, same sort of, you know, um, it's a little bit adolescent, the sort of rebelling against everything. It's a little bit like punk, only they were, they dress differently. Um, now, fortunately, there is one really, really excellent version of Baudelaire in comics, and it's very recent. This is only 2020. It's called Mademoiselle Baudelaire by this artist, Isler. And what it does, and what the best comics in the decadent tradition do, is have decadent artwork, right? Because that's what comics are, they're, they're text and art. So if you just have very plain looking artwork, it, it really goes against the grain, as it were. Um, but you can see here that it's, it's lush, and it's a little bit sinister. You can see an homage to Goya down there in the corner, the sleep of reason produces monsters. Um, so it's very, it's, it's, it's very learned, it's very, a lot of references in it, um, and it's also a little bit dirty, which is what a lot of the decadents were as well. Um, but I, I just love the artwork in this, and the sort of suppleness and, and palpable feel of it, and also the coloring is really brilliant. And the other main decadent that gets a lot of, of coverage in comics is Rambo. Um, Arthur Rambo. And it's not because of his poetry primarily, it's because in the latter part of his life he had adventures in Africa, and that's what most of the books are about. They're about him, you can sort of see the travel motif going on here. It's really much more about that. And they're a little bit prosaic in that way. Um, but, oddly enough, for his time as a poet maudit, a damned poet, which is what he was, um, we have to move out of the Franco-Belgian tradition, which most bad in this are in. And this is a British artist and writer called Nick Hayes. Again, fairly recent. This is 2018, The Drunken Sailor, The Life of the Poet, Arthur Rambaugh. And the whole thing 
is told only with his poetry. So all the lines on it are from a book uh, or a poem that he wrote. But you can see the imagery is very free-flowing. It doesn't have all the sort of panel borders and things that you normally expect in comics. So it flows and it moves like a, um, like a poem. And I think there's also a little, possibly a little homage to, to uh, Hergé's Tantan in the hairstyle there of Rambo, for those of you picking up on that. Um, and just beautiful, this is a double page spread in the book. Um, it's, it's fairly recent, it's very, very uh, available, so you can find it quite easily, unlike some of these things. Now you may be wondering, okay, Baudelaire and Rambo get in there. What about J.K. Huismans, who to some degree sort of kicked the whole um, decadent spirit off with his book, Au Rebours? And this is called, they, they refer to it as the breviary of the decadence. This is sort of the ground zero of decadence in a way. So many people were, read this book and were inspired by it. It was completely groundbreaking in the way that it told its story, and I have to put quotation marks around story, because there's not much story there. It's basically about a fellow, an asthete, who decides that he wants to you know, experience life in a different way, so he goes through these phases where he will experiment with perfumes, and now he will experiment with flowers, and now he will experiment with colors, and he goes through these phases of experimentation, which are described in loving detail. Um, he also has a jeweled tortoise, so a jeweled tortoise is sort of the mascot of the decadent movement, if you will, because it was rumored that Robert de Montesquieu, who was a poet and the most famous dandy in France at that time, had a jeweled tortoise. So the jeweled tortoise shows up in our bores. Um, never been in comics. Probably because it really doesn't have a story. I think in the same way that some books are described as unfilmable, I think largely Arborz is undrawable. I mean, you could you could put pictures to it, but it just would, it has no momentum really. Who's read it or at least skimmed it? Okay, yeah, a few people. And probably when you're much much younger, right? Yeah, it's much more impressive if you're, if you're 17 or 18 years old. You know, the older you get, you have. <laughs> but it's super, super influential. And the, the hero, if you will, of this story, Jean Desessant, is sort of the ne plus ultra, the sort of uh, a hero of a super aesthetic person. Um, that, was, that was what the decadence to some degree looked up to, these super the aesthetic. dies because the jewels are so heavy. The jewels are so heavy, the tortoise dies. So there's a message in there for all of us. <laughs> Um, now, oddly enough, while he doesn't get much of a look in, his friend Jean Laurent does, and Jean Laurent was not a major figure in any literary movement. Um, he's having a little bit of a resurgence now. If anybody knows Snugly Books, the publisher, they've been republishing, or they've been publishing English translations of almost everything that Jean Laurent did. He was scurrilous, so he was primarily a journalist. He wrote novels, he wrote stories, and he wrote a lot of articles, and he was a muckraking journalist. Um, in fact, he's, he's most famous in some circles for having fought a duel with Marcel Proust, um, because he had accused Proust in an article of being a homosexual. Jean Laurent was a homosexual and an out homosexual. Marcel Proust was homosexual, but not an out, out homosexual, so he challenged him to a duel, and they fired in the air, and nobody got hurt. Um, which was just as well for Jean Laurent, because otherwise he would have just been remembered as the guy who killed Proust. Um, so this is a very old, this is from uh, around 1980, and it's super rare. I've only ever seen one copy, which is the copy that I bought, um, by this artist Guy Puccio, uh, Le Prince de la Forêt, um, and some other stories by Jean Laurent. And it's not, it's a little bit fan art-ish, if you can see here. It's not really the work of a professional graphic artist. Mm -hmm. But there's something in it, there's something in the detail and the elaboration and the sort of focus on things like masks and beautiful men and women that, that actually gets the decadent spirit across a lot better than some things that are, that are very professional. <laughs> and believe it or not, there's more Jean Laurent in comics there's a woman named, um, I have to look up her name again. Um, 
Oh, and she has a very strange name that I've just forgotten. It's just off the top of my head. Um, she has done three separate books of Jean Laurent's stories of princesses and things like that, which sound like Disney. They're not Disney. And she's done three books of these in a sort of manga-esque style where there's, a, there's probably a touch of Beardsley in here as well. Um, but really, when you read them, it, it looks most like a sort of manga-influenced thing. And all the women are super pretty, and they wear these beautiful dresses, and they're very idealized. But then, of course, they have to like cut off people's heads and you know all the things that happen in a Jean Laurent story. So it's, a, it's probably the strangest adaptation of decadent works that I've come across. Now, let's come to our side of the, of the channel here and talk about Dorian Gray. Um, I love this cartoon by Gay and Wilson. Now, the picture of Dorian Gray is interesting because there was a series um, started in the 1940s, went into the 50s, and actually went up until, I think, the 80s of classic comics. And these were, in America, these were comics adaptations of works of literature. And they would do some, I guess you'd call high literature, and some sort of you know, Frankenstein is actually <coughs> fairly high literature. Of course, it's been dumbed down for the comic. Jekyll and Hyde is sort of middle of the ground. Count of Monte Cristo is sort of pulp. So they would do these kinds of stories. Never did Dorian Gray. Probably the reason is because if you read Dorian Gray, not a lot happens, at least relative to these stories. And also, what does happen is heavily tinged with an eroticism that you couldn't put in a comic book back then. There, there was one. I read it. Oh, no, there are going to be some. Believe me, there are going to be some. There was this one. It may be what you're thinking of. So actually, the first adaptation of Dorian Gray in comics was in a British comic. It was in Thriller Comics Library in 1956. And what's interesting about 1956 is this is after the horror comic scare that was in America that resulted in the creation of the Comics Code. But they also, the same thing happened in Britain, where they were like, oh my god, look at these horror comics that are coming over from America. These things are dreadful. They actually banned them. But here, you could still do Dorian Gray, but you had to take a few liberties. So if anybody has read the book, you might think, why is there a sword fight on the cover? <laughs> We'll get to that in a minute. It actually starts off pretty good. It starts up pretty much like the book. You know, here he is wishing, wishing, looking at his picture, thinking, if only it would happen the other way. I wish it were I who would always be young and the picture grow old. Okay, we're right there. Perfect. We're going along. Then things start to change. So if you remember in the book, Dorian falls in love with an actress named Sybil Vane. Um, once they fall in love, she starts to act horribly, and he dumps her. Well, and that's, you know, and this is the first sign that he's actually a pretty rotten guy, right? Not in this version. In this version, he's actually blackmailed by Lord Henry Wotton, who's his advisor and sort of the ultimate rake and decadent in the, in the comic, or in the book, rather. Um, here he's saying, you know, you can't marry that woman, and if you do, I'll call in all your debts, and you'll be in bankruptcy court. So they're taking a few liberties. She still dies, not by her own hand, as in the book, but she runs out into the street and gets run over by horses. So, taking a few liberties. The biggest one probably is Dorian, in order, I presume, to make him more masculine and appeal more to the readers of Thriller Comics Library and other boys' comics like that, becomes a sort of Fagin-like figure. He runs an underground crime network in London. <laughs> this is him. Well, what luck tonight, lads? Better than ever, Master C. So they've taken a few liberties. Um, in the book, of course, Dorian shows Basil Hallward, who painted his picture, the grotesque picture as it has evolved, and Dorian kills Basil for having looked on his soul. In this version, they have a sword fight. And he accidentally kills him, which you know, if you've ever been in a sword fight, it's really one of the hazards of sword fighting. <laughs> accidentally killing your opponent when he falls on your sword. You, are, you do have a sword in your hand. It's like accidentally shooting somebody. You had a gun. I mean, come on. But anyway, so he's sort of 
removed some of the blame that he gets in the book for his evil deeds, but at the same time, he's a crime lord. So <laughs> six of one, um, definitely more manly, though. In this, he doesn't stab the canvas. He drives his rapier through the canvas. And then who shows up? The door opens. What? Oh, where is Prince Charming? Where is the fiend I've sworn to kill? So those of you who know the book will recognize James Vane, the sailor, who's actually dead at this point in the book, um, killed not by Dorian, but by a, um, one of a, of a hunting party that Dorian's part of by accident. But in this one, James Vane survives. He comes in at the end and leaves us with this. And I believe what's great about this is I think his foot's actually on the body. So, you know, to get that pose, I guess he had to do that. So the next version of Dorian, actually the next version of, in comics, is almost the complete opposite. And you would have thought, given how much, you know, veiled homosexuality and everything like that there is in Dorian Gray, it would take a long time to get to the point where this could be showed in comics. Not that long. I mean, it was 20 years, but sure. But there weren't any other comics variations in between. And this is in screen number five from Skywald Comics. Um, they did it, now, all these horror, horror magazine comics at the time, the stories were like six to eight pages long, so they had to condense it radically. But they did a pretty good job. Now, I love the artwork in here by an artist named Cesar. So at that time, Skywald was using a bunch of Spanish and Filipino artists who frankly were better than most of the American comics at the time. Um, and he did very illustrative work. In fact, if you look at his work, this is a page from Dorian Gray here. These are illustrations at the time from the Art Nouveau revival that was happening. And if any of you were of that age, you'll remember back then, there was a lot of Beardsley after the 1966 show in, in England. But there was also just this big influence. It was very sort of hip. So you can see that really they're borrowing on that tradition here. So going back to Art Nouveau, which is contemporaneous with decadence, so it all kind of makes sense. Um, the best part about this version is this picture right here. So here's Dorian, as we all know, Dorian sort of gives over to pleasure of any kind, including sexual pleasure. And after that day, Dorian descended in more incredible ways than before. He took to opium. You're not going to see any opium in Thriller Comics Library. His regard for his name was abandoned. He was open in his debaucheries. He cared about no one and nothing. Nothing save his own perverted, endless pleasure. And what's amazing here is that's him with a guy and a gal in bed. And the thing that's beautiful about it, it's not an evil-looking picture, right? I mean, this picture, they, they had a good time. They, you know, they, they, it's peaceful. You know, it's lovely. Even though the caption is sort of purple prose and damning them, the picture itself isn't making a negative statement about homosexuality, which for 1974 in a horror comic magazine, I think is pretty good. There is a Marvel Comics version from 2007, um, which kind of kick-started this little mini wave of Dorian Gray comics, where there were four versions within two years from different places. And the Marvel Comics one, we won't go into it. It's pretty boring. It's very, very faithful, but the artwork's not very good. It's just kind of dull. Um, there is a British one, which is actually very good, by Ian Edgington and INJ Colbard um, from Self Made Hero. You can see here the artwork is very stylized. I love Colbard's work. He's also done a lot of Sherlock Holmes and a lot of Lovecraft. Um, and, it, you know, he just has a really nice line and a nice stylized version. The Portrait de Dorian Gray by Stanislaus Gross, this is a, a weak version. It's got a lovely cover. But the art's just not very good. Plus, they take a few liberties. I don't know why people think they have to mess around with the story so much. So this is actually a scene from near the end of the book where Dorian says, well, what would it, you think if I told you I murdered Basil Hallward? And Lord Henry Watson says, well, I would say you were studying for a role that doesn't suit you. Well, Dorian doesn't like that, so bang, bang. <laughs> there goes Lord Henry. Um, Lord Henry does not die in the book. Fortunately. Um, and if that's not bad enough, he shoots the tortoise. <laughs> Fortunately, the tortoise is protected by a carapace of jewels <laughs> so strong that the bullet ricochets off. So, you know, 
you, you don't shoot. You don't shoot the tortoise. If you take nothing away from this talk, but that, don't shoot the tortoise. But this is the best version. So Dorian Gray by this Spanish artist Enrique Cordomines, and he did a painted version that is just luxurious and very very decadent. Now he also took some liberties. So that's Sybil Vane. So in <laughs> In the book, Sybil Vane is a sort of prim, meek actress, English actress, doing Shakespeare at a crummy little theater and everything. Here she's kind of a burlesque dancer, <laughs> which sort of makes the fall from grace less dramatic, I think. Um, but there's some wonderful scenes. There's a scene in the book Dorian Gray where Dorian is given a poisonous yellow book. It's never identified. But the things in it lead him on to experiment more and more with debauchery. The yellow book is arbores. Uh, French books at that time were printed with yellow covers. It's why the yellow book that Beardsley was the art director of was called the yellow book. It was a, a reference to that. Um, and so for these scenes, Coraminus did some very disturbing drawings in a sort of a yellow wash um, to, to, to reference the yellow book, and, which was, again, arbores. Um, and here you can see the before and after pictures of Dorian, you know, which really, uh, although Dorian looks a little bit louche, even at the beginning, I would have to say, you know, it's hard to believe he's just this sort of prim, pretty boy, which is what he really is in the novel. So that's the one to seek out. Now, some of you may be thinking, wasn't Dorian Gray in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill? And he was not. However, his picture is there on the cover on the cover of the first volume. That's Dorian Gray, and it's signed Basil Hallward down in the corner, in case you missed that. Um, the reason I think that Dorian, he had not showed up at this point, the reason I think they never incorporated him, because they kept going with this series for many years, is because of this, which some of you will recognize as Dorian Gray in the film version of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, played by Stuart Townsend. They did bring him in. He's arguably the most interesting thing in the film. But it's not a very good film, and Alan Moore famously hates every film based on his, on his books. He hates um, From Hell, he hates V for Vendetta, he probably has a special hatred for League of Extraordinary Gentlemen because it's the weakest one. So when they, Kevin O'Neill and Alan Moore, did later series and they needed, hmm, we need somebody who's young, beautiful, and doesn't age. They didn't go for Dorian Gray, they went for Orlando. Orlando by Virginia Woolf. So I don't know if that's why. Maybe he had Orlando in mind all along, but it serves the same sort of role as a character. The, <laughs> by far the funniest version of Dorian Gray is in a book called Masterpiece Comics, which is an, just the title alone is an allusion to both classic comics and masterpiece theater, which was a television show in America where they would show classic British dramas, you know, like Poirot, uh -huh. <laughs> classic British dramas. Um, and this guy is very, very funny. You can see the action authors escaping here, including Oscar Wilde over there on the right. <laughs> and this is a very, very well executed allusion to one of the original Sunday comics in America, back when Sunday papers were huge and the giant comic sections. One of the most lauded comics ever in that format was Little Nemo in Slumberland by Windsor McKay, which is absolutely wonderful. And often what they would do, and you can see an example here, is things would start off being kind of normal, but because all, every episode is a dream by Nemo, they would start to get out of control. So you can see here the plants are growing, growing, growing monstrous. And in the last panel of every one, Dorian, uh, little Nemo would wake up and his mother would be yelling at him. Um, so he's done the same thing with little Dory in Pictureland. And you can see here how it sort of devolves as it goes along. This character, by the way, is named Flip. He's playing Lord Henry Walton. He is actually a bad influence in Little Nemo and Slumberland. So it's, it's a very uh, clever marriage. But you can see the picture is always in the same place and it just gets worse and worse until he has to stab it. And even the last panel, that's the last panel, you know, an example of it from the comics. Um, here, what was that horrible sound? Oh, Dory, is that you? Get up! Well, there you go. That's the end of Dory Gray. 
So, the decadent spirit in horror comics. I want to talk about this because I think that it is one place where the, the literary tradition really comes forward in a very strange way. So horror comics really evolved in America in the 1950s, and they were very, very, very popular to the point where they had to pass legislation basically to run them out of business, because they were also very, very gruesome. Um, and the format for all the stories in EC Comics, which did the most famous ones, some of you will recognize the title, Tales from the Crypt. It's been a movie, it's been a television series. Um, you know, the Crypt Keeper was, you know, sort of iconic for a while. And all the stories in here had the, a formula that was once described by the publisher as, you sharpen the pencils, the pencils sharpen your head. <laughs> so basically, somebody does some really awful things, and then poetic justice in some supernatural, gruesome form happens upon that person. Um, the comics inspired a series of magazines that came about about 20 years later. So you couldn't do horror comics for, for a good 20 years until they realized, oh, gee, you know what? If we put them out as magazines, the comics code has nothing to do with it. We can put them on the magazine rack. So there was a series, uh, several series by Warren, and then these ones were sort of copycat, but they were actually very good and very disturbing. Um, these three all put out by Skywald Publishing. And one of the things that they did that, it, that I think really had that, that decadent feel to it is they sort of did away with periods and exclamation points. In normal comics, almost every sentence ended with an exclamation point. Mm -hmm. And that was for two reasons. One, it made the stories more dramatic if everybody was shouting all the time. But also, the printing uh, methods were so crude that a period could easily get lost. You might not even see it. So instead of that, they favored ellipses. So things just sort of went and then went some more. And you can see examples here. You, if, you can, if you can read that far, dot, 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 you are, dot, 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 my handpicked assassins, dot, dot, the privilege of even the few here in hell suitable for such a task, dot, 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 you are the legions of death, dot, dot, dot. It's really, when you, when you read enough of this, as a kid especially, and these were actually aimed at sort of teenagers and children at the time, um, it was very disturbing, you know, because you weren't used to seeing language like that. And you weren't used to the sort of flowery language that arc the way that the normal horror comics did. So this is about a person who is sort of possessed by this spirit of apparently the Commedia dell'arte demon. And he does bad things. That's all he does. Um, he is a pawn in the complete sense of the word, a very angry man, a very brutal man, determined to be brutal and bloody. Um, his name is Simon Ingalls, which is actually a reference to ghastly Graham Ingalls, who was one of the artists for EC Comics 20 years before. So this guy just basically goes on sprees, and his spirit invades other people who then kill their loved ones and do random crimes. Um, and there's a, there's a panel here. Most of all, to be irrational, he loves to be bohemian. He cherishes the concept of his being a Mr. Hyde, self-indulgent, intelligent, greedy, belligerent, and thoroughly, wonderfully, completely decadent. So there you go. Um, and ultimately, he tries to possess somebody who refuses him, a black man who he's trying to convince him to kill somebody, and he says, no, you know, he, he just rebels. And so this is the last panel. Simon Ingalls cannot understand the rejection of temptation. He's never been tempted, never rejected temptation. Um, percentage of failures is small, is distinct enough to be profound. The profound enter heaven, it's of hell. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I really, it's like we, you know, it's like you were led down this dark path and then you're just left there. And that's what a lot of decadent literature sort of had that feel to it, and certainly the Skywald comics did. Now, this quote up here is from the editor who wrote most of the stories and was very responsible for the overall mood, which they called the horror mood. Um, as one of the writers uh, about this said, what exactly the horror mood was, even Hewitson couldn't really explain, even years later. But the end result of the advent of the horror mood were black and white magazines that oozed mood even more than story integrity. 
Thus, the Skywalk stories often resemble fever dreams that drifted above, below, and around horror motifs rather than traditional horror stories. And that pretty much sums it up and makes the case, I think, for them being arguably the first real decadent American comics. Hewitson said this, he said, sanity is perverse, absolute sanity perverts absolutely. So, which is a very, it's a very Poe type statement, very Baudelaire. Um, now we're going to move into the final chapter here for AD's uh, benefit. AD, AD has a story about D'Annunzio, has a, a relation t to D'Annunzio. While I take a sip, can you just tell us what that is, AD? Well, not me personally, but some of my ancestors, they were basically into the beginning of the 1900s, 1910, just before the First World War, uh, friends uh, of uh, um, this character that he was a friend of the Nunzio that used to stay in the house that now is not ours, my family anymore, it's been sold many years ago. And uh, when he was uh, before his meeting with Marchesa Casati, amongst other things, <laughs> but he was still with Eleonora Duse. And uh, yes, he was a basically uh, an acquaintance of one of my great great grandfather. So, has anybody read The Pike, which was, okay? A couple of people have read it. This is the most recent, and it's an English language um, biography of D'Annunzio, who was a very, very interesting and bizarre character, who loosely fits into the decadent canon, at least the beginning of his life. I should also say that when I first, I've given this talk one other time, it was at a conference in Italy, in Chieta, which is right next to Pescara, which is D'Annunzio's birthplace. And so there were other talks about D'Annunzio in, in, the, in the thing, and I, I thought, if I'm there, I have to put D'Annunzio into this presentation. Um, if, so for those of you who don't know who he was, um, he was actually born in the 1800s, and he died somewhere around World War II. Um, he was a war hero, a warmonger, a poet, a playwright, sex addict, aesthetic, decadent, and city-state ruler. <laughs> Busy guy. So he started as a writer, as a playwright, as a poet, as a novelist, and he wrote works that were sort of in the decadent and aesthetic tradition. Um, he admired writers like Oscar Wilde. He plagiarized writers left and right. He was famous for that. Um, he was also a genuine war hero for the Italians in World War I, and he had many exploits, some of which were brave and adventurous, and some were just kooky. So at one point, he flew a plane over Vienna, uh, no, not Vienna, over Venice, dropping pamphlets that said, surrender, we've got, you know, basically, we've got you surrounded, right? You know, give up, give up. But he didn't drop bombs, he dropped pamphlets. Um, he was involved in various exploits, and so the Italian people really admired him. And he shows up in some of the most iconic Italian series. So Corto Maltese, one of the big Italian series, he shows up in one episode that takes place in Venice, you know, and there he is saying, hello, I am the poet. And there he goes. Um, and he actually has a, has a little bit of a role in this episode. He also shows up in kind of a spin-off of one of the other big Italian series, Martin Mister. And it was a sort of spin-off. He's right there on the cover. And you can see when he shows up, this is, he was, he was described as a gargoyle in real life. But he was popular with the ladies. Um, he was, for some bizarre reason, a ladies' man. Um, most of the comics that are about him are about his wartime exploits. So one of the, th probably the thing he's most famous for in terms of his military activities was after World War I, the Allies were supposed to give certain lands, it's a promise to give certain lands and certain territories back to Italy. Um, and the Italians thought that they didn't give them everything that they were due. In particular, D'Annunzio thought that the city of Fiume, which is now Rijeka, um, should have been given to the Italians. So he decided to go in down there and take it over. And along the way, he was met by many, many convoys of the Italian army meant to stop him, and he would talk to them and explain his cause, and they would join him. So he showed up in Fiume with about 2,000 soldiers. And most of the people in Fiume were Italian. So they were like, come on in. So he basically took it over and said to Italy, come on in, annex, annex it, I've got it for you. 
And they said, we're not going to do that. We made this pact with the Allies. We're not going to go against the Allies. So he held out there for a good year. Um, ultimately, they had to actually bring the Navy in to kick him out. And he did leave. Um, but there's, so there's a lot about it. Fiume o morte. I mean, he was really sort of a, a martyr to the cause of, of Italy here. Um, but there's also a, a three-volume version of his life, La Vita e Fumetti. Um, now, you can see here that he's being romanticized, oh, a tad, because the picture on the far right is an homage to a famous picture of Robert de Montesquieu by Baldini. And Montesquieu was reckoned generally to be about the most elegant and good-looking guy in France at that time. Nobody ever thought that about Denunzio. Um, here you can see him uh, again. Very, you know, here he's got hair. You know, so you know, there's hope for everybody. You know, if you get in the <laughs> comics, you can get hair back. Um, there's a, the same artist, uh, Marco Schiame, did a comic version of a play that came out a few years ago. Um, basically, his loves and battles. And you can see that the guy playing him was playing him as a little, sort of a little bit on the middle-aged side. And I actually um, wrote to the artist to find out, like, he's, he's supposed to be at the end of his life, pretty much, in this comic and in the play, but he doesn't look like He said, the representation of Denunzio was actually debated in the first series, our poet, that was the, the biography, was in his early Roman youth and therefore still handsome and with more hair, let's say. The choice on the comic strip released with the theatrical show is quite different, and there were various disagreements there. Originally, I had done a series of comic strips with a very old and bald Gabriel, which was challenged by the publisher. I agreed to rejuvenate the Vate, but without taking responsibility for the recommended choice. Um, and just to give you a sense, this is, this is him in the prime of his youth. He's actually wearing two-toned shoes. You can't see them in this picture, but there are many bigger pictures where you can see that. Very much, yeah, see, this is how you look towards the end, right? You know, a bit more like Mussolini. Mussolini was a huge admirer of Denuncio, by the way. Um, one of the most favorable modern representations of Denuncio comes in this book, which is about the Marchesa of Cassati. Um, and it, this is only a few years old by an Italian artist named Lepvani. And I pulled these panels from different places in the book. But you can see, he actually comes off pretty well here. He, he was a lover and also a friend of the Marchesa. Um, but he comes off as pretty thoughtful and he cares about her and he's, he's, a, he's a fairly good guy in this version. The version is called Black Paths. And it's basically about a couple of young people caught up in the madness that is happening in Fiume at the time that Denunzio was running the place and is about to get kicked out. And Denunzio is portrayed as being, you know, kind of the crazy warlord that he was. But also, he still gets some good lines. Um, for example, I love, so this is, this is the chaos that was happening. I mean, at the time, Fiume, they had a charter, um, one of the first constitutions in that area that was actually pretty liberal, but it was also enforced by a bunch of bully boys. So the towns were, you know, the streets were roamed by these gangs of thugs, basically, in, in uniforms who could do whatever they want. Um, and this, this auditor shows up, and Denunzio here is showing him around, and the auditor says, oh, it's your famous collection of objets d'art. And Denunzio says, only part of it. Which I think is, is, is a nice line. He, and then says, can I offer you a drink out of a skull? You know. Uh, his funniest thing is, um, where were we? I was saying, we have to pick a date for the worldwide revolution. I've got something on the 18th. <laughs> But we could do it the next day. Um, so I want to leave you with one final version of Denunzio in comics form. This is not, I'm breaking my own rule, this is not in a comic book. This is a book of caricatures. Denunzio was caricatured to the nth degree. There are at least a couple of books of caricatures from different people of Denunzio at the time. And this, this guy, this is a fairly recent book too by Francesco Perova. And he did this one, which is him with a, an athlete. And he was big on masculinity and athletics and everything like that. Um, but does anybody recognize the athlete who's holding him? Is he from the Maxwell? Exactly. He is. <laughs> Uncredited, a 
reference to Alfred E. Newman, the mascot of Mad Magazine in America. So there you go. Uh, if you would like to explore the world of decadence more, a couple of examples. There is a group called the British Association of Decadence Studies, which is run out of Goldsmiths Universities. They have an online publication, Volupte. You can join, I believe, now for free. Um, they do sometimes conferences and talks. It's a very interesting organization. Um, very heavily, it's more on the sort of very heavy literature and, and literature study side. The Oscar Wilde Society, which I'm the press officer, if you want to know more about Oscar Wilde, is a good one to join. And I do have a Facebook page, Picks of Dorian Gray, which has uh, started as 100 co different covers of Dorian Gray in very different styles that people had done that had been published. And then I, I got through 100 and I just started posting more stuff about Dorian Gray. So if you're interested in Dorian Gray, you can check that out. That's it, and I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has. Just quick. Hello. Sorry, just quick. You know, because you mentioned the disorder with the, the top two as with the jewels on top. Uh, Marquesa gave as a present uh, because Anunza was besotted for the rest of his life with her after the yeah. affair. They become a very good friend, and etc. We have this incredibly beautiful tortoise that he died because, again, it was uh, it's still at the Vittoriale. You can see the carapace with all these jewels, oh, yeah. just in the, exactly to, to prove the sense of the decadence. <laughs> you know. And it's there. And I warmly recommend if you have the chance to visit the, the Vittoriale, it will take at least three days. That's our, that's our next vacation, is we're going to oh, go see it. The Vittoriale. Okay, so, for Ivatoriale was um, Denuncio's sort of palace-like home on, on the banks of Lake Garda. He was a huge collector of art and just junk. Yeah. And he assembled it in this bizarre sort of 3D collage that is this house, just filled with stuff from classical sculptures to Jesus to everything under the sun. And he piled it on top of each other and put hats on statues. and. All kinds of bizarre yeah. stuff. So. And, and the boat. Yeah, like and the boat, boat. yeah. yeah. So yeah. one of the boats that he uh, was on during World War One is there. The boat itself is on the hillside, mm -hmm. as well as one of the planes that he yeah. flew. Oh, book, yeah, so, you know. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly recent movie called Il Cattivo Poeta. I haven't put out in English yet, but it's about the fact that towards the end of his life, Mussolini was really worried about D'Annunzio, because D'Annunzio still had all this pull, right? He, he was very popular, and Mussolini was about to sign a pact with Hitler. D'Annunzio hated the Germans, and he didn't want the Italians to have anything to do with them, and he was trying to convince Mussolini to not do this pact. And Mussolini basically just tried to keep him in Ivatoriale and send him presents to sort of buy him off and keep him quiet and make sure that he didn't interfere with his... Wonderful plans that went so well. <laughs> <laughs> yes? How and where did you find the English copy of Classics Illustrated, the, the 50s Dorian Gray English copy book? Do, do you have a copy of it? Yeah. How and where did you find it? Yeah, on eBay. Oh. You can, you can still buy It's not actually very expensive. I mean, it's not collectible. Those, those comics really weren't very collectible. So, um, yeah, you can find them. Well, I think if you could if you could make sense out of its sort of bizarre structure, La Ba would be a pretty obvious one to try to do because it's got fun stuff like Satanism and you know black masses and all that kind of stuff in it. Um, like I said, a lot of the I just read a, a book by Jules Barbe d'Orvilly who slightly predates the decadence but knew them and. His, his most famous work in English, well, he wrote the book about um, Beau Brummel, 
that really, I think, made Bo Brummel much more famous, especially outside England. But he also, um, he wrote a book called Les Diaboliques, which is not like the French film, it's a completely different story. And it's six stories about women, so it's episodic, but even that, it's like the stories don't have the arc that you would expect in a short story. They sort of, it's much more like they set a mood, something bad happens, but there's not really the resolution you would expect. And that's what makes it hard for these things to be translated. There's, there's a wonderful one that I'd love to see somebody do a comic of, which Jean Laurent did call Monsieur de Bougerland, which is this fantastical sort of um, Baron Munchausen-esque story about this crazy tour guide who shows up to these tourists one day in Paris and offers to show them around, and he's dressed like this, you know, 17th century dandy. He's actually a caricature of Jules Barbet d'Orvilly, who Jean Laurent knew. Um, and it's just this, it's this wild and really, really funny story. And, it, and it's been, that you can get in English, so Monsieur de Bougelon, because a lot of decadent fiction, even when I went to the conference, given when I went to the conference on decadent literature, one of the speakers gave a talk that basically amounted to, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> Why do you like this stuff? And uh, I said, go read Monsieur de Bougelon, because it is very, very funny. Have you read Dave Sims' High Society? It's about, uh, yeah, it's about Oscar. The, the, well, there's one about Oscar. Yeah. And yeah. It's with Astoria and the Matthew Blythe thing has become the Prime Minister. And it's about, about, about the battle between the church and state. Yeah, yeah. The Cerebus, yeah. yeah. Do you think it could be made into a film? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that anybody would want to work with Dave Sim, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think you'd have to get over Cerebus himself, who is like, what, like a hedgehog, mm -hmm. who is the star of these, of Dave Sims comics. Yeah. So he, he was a, originally a um, piss take of Conan the Barbarian. So there you go. Aardvark. 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 Okay. There you go. All righty. <laughs>